back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Glad to be back with you today. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries, a premier maritime and tactical training company founded by and composed of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for Department of Defense, local law enforcement, and U.S. citizens. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you are a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next big project, Valletta Industries is an SBA certified hub zone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, they solve problems. To learn more, go to www.valettaindustries.com. Well, it was 60 years ago this spring that uh, conflict was heating up in a spot that had been a trouble spot for some time now, Southeast Asia. And in the spring of 1964, before our full-on engagement in Vietnam, before the Tonkin Gulf incident even that August, Navy pilot Lieutenant Charles Klusman was the first U.S. aviator to be shot down in the burgeoning Vietnam conflict while on a recon mission over Laos. His story of his landing, his capture, his ordeal as a prisoner of war, his amazing escape, and his trek through the jungle and the mountains to freedom is one that inspires to this day. And we are thrilled to present the Charles Klusman story in the current April issue of Naval History Magazine. And here to discuss his article is our good friend and frequent contributor, Edward J. Marauda. Ed, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here today with your audience, with you. Look forward to our discussion. So do I. Um, this is just a heck of a story. Um, it's got everything going for it. Um, it's a story of human endurance, survival, escape. Um, and this is actually before Johnson, the new president, commits his full on to a fuller and more full-fledged engagement in Vietnam. So this is very early on, as this thing's about to really ramp up in uh, 1964. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what these Navy recon guys were doing flying over Laos, how Charles Klusman got into the situation he was in, and um, the remarkable story that ensued. Uh, it really is a remarkable story, and I'm glad you helped set the table, and I'll, I'll further to that. Uh, the previous year, 1963, uh, was not a good year for U.S. foreign policy and our strategy in Southeast Asia. On the 1st of November, 1963, President Ngo Dinh Diem of South Vietnam, the Republic of Vietnam, was assassinated by officers of his own military. And, of course, everyone in America knows that on the 22nd of November, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated as well. And the other side, the uh, folks in Hanoi, the Republic of North Vietnam, Democratic Republic of Vietnam, uh, decided now was the time to really take advantage of uh, all the problems that we were suffering from and the South Vietnamese were suffering from as well. Uh, because along with the uh, trouble in the, with the government in Saigon, uh, there were Buddhist monks who were upset about the way things were going on, happy with their treatment by the uh, ZM regime, and many people remember uh, bonzes, if you will, religious leaders uh, immolating themselves in, in the streets of Saigon. So the nation was in turmoil politically, militarily, it wasn't much better. The uh, Viet Cong, the Southern Communist, if you will, National Liberation Front soldiers, uh, were really getting better and better at uh, dealing with our our forces there. Of course, we were in a supporting role at this point. Uh, we had Green Berets minus John John Wayne, but uh, the Green Berets from the Army Navy SEALs really began cut their teeth in Vietnam, and this was the early period. But things were not going well on the ground. The counterinsurgency struggle to beat back the communists, both the Northerners and the Southerners, uh, was not doing well. And major South Vietnamese military units were being uh, savaged in battle. So the picture was not good. And the way the 
administration in Washington of Lyndon Johnson uh, regarded things at this point was that, all right, if things are not going well in South Vietnam and we blame Hanoi for stirring up trouble, then we have to put pressure on North Vietnam to stop doing this sort of thing, to stop supporting the insurgency. And so a lot of folks, even in 62, 63, have been talking about, well, let's apply some military pressure against North Vietnam. Now, the administration in Washington did not want to go that step, a strong military step. So where else can we affect operations, the North Vietnamese operations? Well, the North Vietnamese were in Laos, the neighboring country of Laos, which borders both North and South Vietnam. Now, Laos had been declared neutral in 1962, and no foreign troops were supposed to be there. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, the North Vietnamese never left. Uh, we left temporarily, but we came back in with uh, the CIA and Air America was the name of the, their aviation uh, component. So there were American and there were North Vietnamese uh, military forces in, in Laos. So rather than striking North Vietnam, which might have undue consequences, the thinking was, well, let's apply some pressure against the North Vietnamese in Laos. Now, why were the North Vietnamese in Laos? Number one, there aren't too many ways to get into the heart of South Vietnam unless you go through Laos. So they had begun building as early as 1959 what we now call the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a ser series of trails, really roads, uh, paths, cart paths, you name it, through the jungle, through uh, along the rivers in, in Laos. And so the North Vietnamese are in there uh, building that, that transportation route, logistic route. They had the assistance of the, the local communists in Laos. They called the Pathet Lao. And they were fighting with the North Vietnamese to help establish this, this uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail but at the same time, they were the, the Laotian communists wanted to overthrow the government in Vientiane, at this point headed by Savannah Fuma. And now Savannah Fuma had been an, a neutralist or even not pro-American uh, before this time, but he had become more pro-American because he felt threatened by uh, the North Vietnamese and also by his own local communists. So he, he had acquiesced to uh, U.S. reconnaissance planes and other other aircraft and other military means uh, working in Laos. Now, at first it was supposed to be on the QT, but no secret lasts too long, uh, certainly not in that war. So anyway, the uh, the pressure was, okay, well, let's, we'll send some reconnaissance planes over uh, the eastern part of Laos. And the North Vietnamese theoretically will see these American planes say, oh, no, Uncle Sam is here. We certainly don't want to get them angry. Well, that was the thinking in Washington. I mean, this is a period of great naivete, if you will, that American power is so overwhelming that the North Vietnamese will quake, quake in their boots and quickly run back into North Vietnam. As we know, of course, that did not happen. And this is also part of the strategic ethos of the time, if you will, called graduated escalation. It was a political science theory strategic theory, and the thinking was that you apply a little bit of military pressure to get the other side to bend to your will. If they don't bend to your will, you apply a little bit more military pressure. And eventually, they're going to cry uncle because they can't stand up against the military might of the United States. That's the thinking. And uh, this, so this was an attempt, very early attempt, to apply that pressure in Laos. Um, Charles uh, Chuck Klusman, young Lieutenant JG, was on board Kitty Hawk, and he had the mission. He was in uh, Reconnaissance Squadron, VFP 63, Photo Reconnaissance Squadron 63, to mount a mission over the eastern part of Laos, close to the, the, the Plain of Jars, as it's called. The French named it the Plain des Jars. Uh, so he's, you know, he's following a reconnaissance aircraft or RF 8A Crusader. It's unarmed. There were no escorts, and this whole mission was called Operation Yankee Team. It kicked off on the 19th of May, 1964. <clears throat> involved both the U.S. Navy 
and the U.S. Air Force, a joint operation to send reconnaissance planes over the areas of, of Laos, both the Ho Chi Minh Trail and also eastern Laos, the central Laos, if you will, toward the border with North Vietnam. Uh, that kicked off on the 19th of May, and um, shortly thereafter, uh, Klusman went on his first mission. He and his uh, wingman, they both, their planes went into Laos, and he, he was not afraid. He said later, oh, I didn't think we were going to be shot at. Uh, this sort of thing doesn't happen. Um, you know, real naivete again. Not only can't blame him, and he's getting this all up the chain of command. They're not really concerned about the enemy presence. So he flies in there, and he takes rounds. He takes, you know, rounds hit his plane. He's being fired at. Obviously, he, he's in trouble. So they get back safely to Kitty Hawk. They're not shot down, but they do have holes in their planes. And uh, the thinking was, well, that maybe that's just a reaction of a local commander, or this is probably not policy from Hanoi. And it's not taken seriously. So they, uh, they poo-poo it, if you will, in Washington. And, and I have to make the point here that uh, there was great micromanagement from Washington, thousands and thousands of miles away from the scene, uh, by people wanting to be field marshals, if you will. Um, President Johnson, but to a greater extent, Secretary of Defense McNamara, Robert S. McNamara, uh, really wanted his hands in all the details. And so at this point, he said, well, that was just an aberration. Go back in. Well, they we sent in other aircraft, Air Force and Navy at this time, and uh, on the 6th of June, uh, Klusman and his wingman, Jerry Kuchman, fly their RF-8s about 500 miles from the carrier across northern South Vietnam and into Laos. And they're flying low and slow. Okay, you think, well, that doesn't sound very sound. But at this point, we were so confident that the enemy would not, would not do anything to oppose our presence it wouldn't be a problem. So 500 feet, uh, maybe going 300 knots or 400 knots, not very fast, not very high. Well, the 6th of June, uh, sure enough, uh, they, they over the plain of, not the plain of Jars, but over the eastern part of Laos, they take fire. And Klusman's plane is hit. He starts to leak fuel. He starts to have fire on board. And they... Earlier, they had gotten out of there by flying the first mission when they were fired on. They flew up high uh, out of the reach of North Vietnamese anti-aircraft weapons and made it back to the carrier. Uh, this time, he didn't have a chance. Uh, 37 millimeter rounds impacted his plane, and he lost power. He knew, we're going down. I'm going down. Uh, so he ejected safely. He was not injured on ejection. Uh, Kuchman stood by to lend assistance. Well, Klusman's plane, as uh, Klusman is gliding to earth with his parachute, he sees his plane impact and, and explode. It's destroyed. And it's fairly open area, but there's one tree in the middle of this big field. He says, oh, no, I want to avoid that tree. Unfortunately, he doesn't avoid the tree. He crashes through it. He injures his knee, his ankle, and he's battered up. He lands safely. He survives the landing, and he hides in the in the bushes successfully for a while. And he puts out a call and Air America aircraft, to a couple of fixed wing aircraft, and later an H thirty four helicopter arrive at the scene. And um, the enemy so far has not made much of a presence, but as soon as these aircraft show up, all hell breaks loose. Uh, they actually. They set, had set a trap because they knew search and rescue equipment would be there shortly. And so those planes are taking fire. They're taking hits. And in a great act of bravery, Klusman waves off the aircraft. He says, I don't want to have them shot down trying to get me. The chances of them picking me up are nil, almost nothing. Uh, so they go away. And he, he is then spotted, of course, and then, the uh, Pathet Lao guerrillas capture him. They bind his hands behind his back. 
uh, they put a yoke around his neck to, with a rope to pull him along. Well, they discover he's injured. He can't walk very well with all these encumbrances. Uh, so they actually loosen his binds behind his back and the, the, the collar around his neck and uh, try to help him along. Now, this is uh, unusual for what we later know about prisoner treatment in both North Vietnam and in Laos. Uh, they treat him fairly decently, if you will. I mean, he's injured, and but they, they take him al along to a jungle camp uh, miles away. And uh, he's fed that evening. He's given a little bit of meat, a little, some vegetables, and he was not beat up or, or harmed in any way that way. Uh, they bring him to the uh, first of a series of uh, jungle camps, and he is uh, incarcerated and put into the, uh, it's a one-room hut, if you will, uh, for this, his first uh, captivity. And there's nothing much there. There's a wooden table, a couple of chairs, some other very rudimentary, something to sleep on, uh, I think a, a very thin blanket, but that's about it. And he's there for, for quite a while. And um, he at one point, following the code of conduct, as he's taught, and he had gone through the survival, escape, and resistance uh, tr training, SEER training, uh, back in the States. And so he knew you had to try and resist your, your captors, and but you try to escape. If that's part of your code of conduct. You should make every attempt to get out. So he starts digging around the walls to his, his hut while well, he discovers that the path at Lao had actually put bamboo fences down into the dirt some four or five feet. Uh, he couldn't get through that. So that first attempt was, was a failure. And um, so he's there, and there's a daily uh, routine. Actually, I'll, at uh, a later point in time, uh, he is put together with a number of about 35 uh, Laotians who had run a fall of the communist, the path at Lao, uh, some Thai soldiers and some others, some Lao soldiers. Uh, so they're all in, in this together. And uh, there was a routine every day. The guards would take two guards. You'd have one with a, with a weapon. Another one just would be the escort and take a uh, Klusman down to a, a local stream. And they did the same for the other prisoners where they would wash their clothes, brush their teeth, morning ab ablutions, if you will, and then wash their clothes. And as they came back toward the, the hut, uh, they would put their clothes on a fence, the enclosure fence to the, to the little POW camp. Over time, as they are putting these clothes on the fence, they're loosening the bolts that hold the fence together behind the clothes uh, for that day when they want to make their break. Uh, so they uh, they do buy their time, and um, and I should I go back to uh, right after when Klusman is captured, he is brought to uh, a place where he's familiar with because he's seen it flying overhead a number of times, and he is put in front of the thirty-seven millimeter anti-aircraft crew that had shot his plane down, and this is a big event for the the local path at Lao. And uh, there is a dignitary there that uh, has never been named or identified accurately, but Kusman, Kusman believed believes that it was actually Suvanafong, Prince Suvanafong, better known as the Red Prince. He was the head of the Path at Lao. Now, we don't have absolute documentation of that, but that's what Kusman suspected. And uh, he's also introduced to a fellow named Boon Kam. And Boon Kam, supposed to be Laotian, but Klusman really thought he was North Vietnamese, pre masquerading as Laotian. Well, he be Boon Kam becomes his interrogator for the next several months. And uh, the code of conduct uh, after Korea, just stepping aside, had been to uh, name, rank, and serial number, date of birth. That's all you're supposed to give. Okay, well, a little, a little before the beginning of these activities in, in Vietnam, uh, the Air Force had come out with some guidance that basically said, try to fool your captor, give them false information, you know, screw up their thinking and all that. 
And so Klusman tried a bit of that, but he discovered to his shock that Boone Com actually had access to something like Jane's All the World's Aircraft with all of the aircraft types listed where they were. And more than that, he had information from the Pacific Fleet Organization Manual that listed all the ships, the commanding officers, the planes, the whole works. And they, they even he even knew, Boncom even knew when Kitty Hawk had come into the theater. So they don't need tactical information. And that was something true even later on in North Vietnam. Uh, the enemy was really not looking for tactical information. They had plenty of it. But they wanted to turn him politically against the, the U.S. administration and the war effort. And that's the way the interrogator proceeded along that path to break his uh, political will. He offered close when he said, you know, everybody probably thinks you're dead. So don't you want to tell your loved ones that you're still alive? Why don't you just sign something here and well Klusman didn't do that. He said, no, no, no way in my hell am I going to do that. Um, but as time went on and he's, his health is deteriorating because he's not being fed well, well enough, uh, the medical care is rudimentary, all these things. Uh, he, and he gets delir delirious at various times. He finally, I don't know what you say, he broke his will, but, uh, Boncom got him to, to actually sign a statement, which Kuzman really regretted after that. But he said, I was in such a state, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, so anyway, he did make that statement, and off went Boncom, not to be seen again. He got his uh, objective achieved. But going back to when uh, Kuzman met with, uh, with uh, Suvana Fong, and they had a little theater show there, Kuzman is in a cage, Here's the 37 millimeter anti-aircraft crew and a whole bunch of villagers around clapping. Oh, here's the American in the cage. And Klusman said from that point on, he never wants to go to near a, near a zoo because he knows what the animals feel like being caged. Um, okay, so he, Eric, did you want to jump in at this point? No, you're doing, this is, I'm just uh, captivated right. by the story. Just that that wasn't like edited. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, All right, well, I'll just proceed then beyond that. Um, so they uh, he befriends a number of the Laotian prisoners and uh, tries, has to gain their, he, he, they have to gain his confidence and vice versa uh, because he said, I don't want to start divulging things to someone and then they turn on me, turn me in. Uh, so, but he does find a, a core of people who he can trust they start planning an, another escape. And so one dark, rainy night, just like in the movies, uh, the local guard right outside their hut is uh, goes and hides in his little guard shack to avoid the weather. So they say, aha, this is our time. They go out to the fence, they loosen the, the, the attachments, whatever it was, and four of them scoot through the fence and out into the surrounding jungle. Now, one of the guys... Laotian says, I think I'm going to wait here because I think there are two more guys that are going to follow us. They never see him again. And either he, probably he and the other two who were trying to escape were caught and executed. So now we have three. You have uh, Kusman and two other Laotians. Uh, they head out into the jungle. And uh, they had a little bit of food, but nothing much. They had actually had to you know, raid farmers' fields and and pick berries from the trees and things of that sort. Uh, they come to one hut and they're watching the hut. And one of the Laotian or the yeah one of the Laotian says, "Okay, I'm starving to death. I want to get some food. I'm going to go see if this villager can help me." So he goes into this hut, and the other two are back in the jungle. They're watching, and out comes that Laotian with his hands behind his back, AK-47s pointed at his back. Obviously, he's been captured, recaptured. So they beat feet because he, he, the guy who's captured, probably told his captors, yeah, I'm with the two other guys out here. So they start running after them. So off they go into the jungle. And um, it's like three and a half days. They go 25 miles through very rugged country. This is mountainous. Laos is very mountainous. Uh, jungle. You know, waterways, swamps, you name it. Uh, they're, they're hungry, they're beat up, 
uh, and of course their health is not great from their time in captivity. And um, they finally get to a place where they see another guard shack and they hear people talking. And Klusman, having witnessed the first guy who came out and was taken away, said, oh, we don't want to go near it. But the, the, his companion, now there are just two of them, uh, his name is Boon Me. Boon Me says, I think I recognize their, <clears throat> what they're saying, and they sound like they're not communist. So he takes the brave step and goes in and talks to them. And sure enough, they say, oh, well, welcome back. You know, you're, you're safe. So they both came in. That's the <clears throat> middle to the end of August of 1964. They are, and they're, the CIA people, it's a CIA run out uh, uh, airfield right there. So the CIA folks come out and they're joyous too. Here's an American that made it back and his Laotian companion. Put him on a plane. He goes to Udorn Air Base in Thailand, thence out to the Seventh Fleet in the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, where he is uh, later greeted. I've, we've seen the picture with uh, Admiral Sharp, who was then Sink Pack Fleet, Pacific Fleet Commander, later. Pacific Command commander, and Roy Johnson, who's the Seventh Fleet commander. They greet him, and they're just they are regaled with the story and just you know amazed by it. Uh, so he becomes the first naval aviator shot down and imprisoned and escaped in Southeast Asia. There's only one more. Uh, Dieter Dengler, German American, came over from Germany after the war is shot down in 1966, and he is rescued. Those are the only two uh, Navy and, and um, Navy and Marine Corps aviators, and I, I suspect even the Air Force, who ever got out of Laos again. Or, of course, nobody got out of North Vietnam either. <clears throat> so those two guys, they're it, that escaped, escaped into freedom. It's remarkable, isn't it? The very first one shot down is one of the only two who ever escapes. Mm -hmm. Lucky. He was definitely uh, in that regard. I mean, it was an ordeal, and he earned that escape. Oh, absolutely. Well, he uh, got a distinguished flying cross for his uh, waving away the search and rescue force. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to follow up on going back to that, <clears throat> obviously the search and rescue didn't work for him. But very shortly afterward, another crew from, uh, from Kitty Hawk flew out there, and Doyle Lynn was the name of this aviator. He was shot down. And because of some of the lessons they had already learned from the Klusman shoot down <clears throat> were applied here, they actually got him, picked him up, and brought him back to the ship. Unfortunately, tra tragically, he was killed the following year in combat flying. But uh, the search and rescue effort was learning as they went along. Uh, they also, this also relates to the, uh, I mentioned the code of conduct earlier that it was pretty well determined that the enemy was going to break you. I mean, if they have you for year after year after year, constant torture and, and mistreatment, they're going to get you to talk. The thing is you have to come back. Don't give up. You come back and you continue to resist as well as you can until maybe the next time. Uh, and that was pretty much followed. Um, uh, Jim Stockdale, Medal of Honor <clears throat> recipient, and others who were POW leaders really instilled in their people, don't don't quit, keep up. They're going to break you. I mean, they're beastly the way they treat. Now, and they, just talking about the treatment, <clears throat> unlike the North Vietnamese, the Laotians, at least in this period, they didn't physically torture Kusman or, or I guess uh, well Kusman. Uh, you know, he suffered from bad medical care and bad nutrition and the rest of it. But, for instance, they they did provide meat every so often. They'd go out and they'd hunt rats in the local caves or stray dogs would, you know, end up in the pot. So he was getting some meat and they'd have vegetables and fish sauce and that sort of thing. Uh, they did send in some medical medicines, if you will. I don't know how effective they were, but his health was deteriorating, so... It couldn't have been all that great. Um, so they didn't really uh, abuse them the way the North Vietnamese did. They had a systematic program of, uh, of mistreatment. Um, and going back to the, uh, I talked about this being a period of Navy strategy, or actually U.S. strategy, 
graduated escalation. Okay, we're going to try a little bit of the, we're going to fly reconnaissance planes over Laos. Of course, they won't shoot at them. Well, they did shoot at them. They shot them down. They shot down Klusman and Doyle and, and, of course, others. So, okay, well, I guess that's not going to work. <clears throat> McNamara, who really got involved in tactical detail, telling the commanders throughout the chain of command, uh, fly this many planes at that level, carry how many bombs. I mean, this is the Secretary of Defense. So they're saying, hey, we're our guys are getting shot down. So, oh, all right, well, then raise them up to 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet. And uh, <clears throat> so they did that. So the losses went down, okay? By the end of 1964, there had been 400 uh, Navy and 400 Air Force sorties as part of the Operation Yankee team. So we're not losing as many planes. But reconnaissance planes that have cameras taking pictures from 500 feet, the pictures are a lot better than from 15,000 feet. So what's the message? I mean, number one, you're not gathering intelligence on what the enemy's doing on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And number two, are we scaring them from 15,000 feet? No. I mean, American, I mean, American leaders got together at the end of the year at a meeting, joint service meeting, and said, is this having an effect? And the consensus was, not really. We don't even think the North Vietnamese knows there's any being pressure being applied. I mean, it's just... And at one point, they go into, an, it's called Operation Barrel Roll, where we actually start bombing stuff. But we'll, we'll take out a bridge, we'll knock out a truck. I mean, it, it just had, it did not have the intended effect to get the North Vietnamese to change their behavior. So along with this theory of graduated escalation, the next step is, okay, we have to do direct action against North Vietnam, Okay. We had Operation 34 Alpha, which is sending uh, nasty boats up there to shell targets ashore in North Vietnam, uh, crewed by South Vietnamese crews. Um, that didn't really have an effect, although it did generate uh, enemy response because they were pissed off. And they came out, as we know, on the, 4th, uh, the 2nd of August, 1964, uh, they attacked Maddox. Three PT boats came out and attacked Maddox. Two nights later, we thought they had attacked Maddox and Turner Joy, another destroyer. That one didn't happen, but we thought it did, for at least for a short time. Uh, it was bogus. They, they did not come out that night. And so that's the next step. But that was the one, and it was followed by a retaliatory response called Pierce Arrow. Pierce Arrow was a one-time strike against um, naval bases and boats in the offshore areas that a one-time thing. We they, we went back after that. Okay, we gave them a, a sharp stick hit. And uh, that was it. There was no systematic program. Oh, that didn't work. As you know, at that same time, the North Vietnamese really started to, to plus up their infiltration of troops into South Vietnam via the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, okay, the next up in the graduate escalation theory was direct, you know, a concentrated continuous military operation, hence Operation Rolling Thunder, the Air Force and Navy bombing campaign that lasted for the next three and a half years. So that's what responded from this early period. And the um, I mentioned naive Tay about uh, the patrol planes over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This goes through the whole raft of what the U.S. is doing at this time. We really thought of the North Vietnamese, in fact, <clears throat> it's a famous quote, I've used it probably too often, but uh, Secretary of the Navy Paul Mitzi made a statement at this point that, well, it's this little third-rate country. They're not going to come out against the United States. It's not going to happen. And that was uh, general thinking, general thinking among uh, civilian and military leaders. The North Vietnamese, it's a third-rate, as Johnson said, third-rate pissant country. And they're not going to come out. Well, the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese communists were determined to stay the course. I mean, we found that out to our uh, displeasure by 1975. Um, and another thing we, we really disregarded was the, uh, the support from the Sino-Soviet world to North Vietnam was enormous. I mean, we now know the, the Chinese had 
300,000 troops in North Vietnam at one point or another during the war, manning anti-aircraft units, repairing uh, railroads, um, airfields, ports, you name it, they're helping. The Soviets, of course, sent in their technicians, their advisors to set up the uh, most phenomenal anti-air defense in, in history up to that point, uh, which took up. And by the way, Clouston's plane was the first of 1,125 Navy and Marine Corps aircraft shot down during the war, uh, to both combat and operational accidents. So his, his was the first in that regard. He was the first taken prisoner, naval aviator, first escapee, a number of firsts for Charles Clouston. Um, Eric, do you want to jump in with Yeah, me? Yeah, I was going to say... Um... It's, a, it's remarkable in its historical context, all those firsts and how it's sort of a harbinger for the some of these sort of futilities to come and the difficulties to come. Uh, but on the human level, it's an amazing story, too. Um, the way that they figure out a way to escape from there, the, the friendship. I mean, there's this distrust at first with the, his fellow Laotian prisoners, who's really a prisoner, who's not. No. But he and um, the one he escapes with become, you know, they bond over this. And that is quite an um, uh, ordeal they go through just to get to uh, the freedom line. And mm -hmm. yeah, Klusman looks like Robinson Crusoe by the time he gets there. It's just, it's just I'm so happy for him just to see the picture, you know. So what about, you know, what follows from this in the aftermath of it? Um, a little bit about what happens in his life um, once he reaches freedom. Well, it's actually a good news story. He... Uh, <clears throat> As a, he was flown to uh, Udorn, the airbase in Thailand, then on to the uh, Seventh Fleet in the Tonkin Gulf, and then flown home to, I think, San Diego. And he's greeted there by his wife. And, um, you know, joyous. And it was, this was big news all over the states, you know, the, all headlines, because the first, the first of many firsts. And uh, so you would have thought, well, maybe he's just going to end his career. He had a Naval Reserve Commission. Uh, but he served for, until 1980 in the U.S. Navy, retiring as captain. He's a, a XO of a, a number of squadron, aviation squadrons, a commanding officer of another one. He goes to uh, post, postgraduate school at Monterey, California, and then to the Naval War College for the course there. And he ends his career as commanding officer of the Mine Warfare Command in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he and his wife, and they have two children, and they now have three grandchildren. Uh, they they moved to Pensacola, Florida, home of naval aviation, appropriately. And uh, in fact, I'd like at this point to have a shout out for Hill Goodspeed, who's my good friend and colleague of long standing at the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, uh, for really getting into some of the Clusive material which he's he's gathered over the years. And also, I'd like to thank Mrs. Klusman for providing some very good pictures to you, Eric, and uh, Naval History Magazine. I uh, really sharpened up the publication quite a bit. I mean, at least my article is sharpened up. Your publication's already sharp. <laughs> um, so anyway, that uh, so yeah, it's a good good news story. Right. I second that shout out uh, on both fronts, uh, Mrs. Klusman and uh, our good friend Hill Goodspeed. Um, the uh, the illustrations for this story help. Uh, Help liven up what's already an amazing tale, and um, I, if you haven't read it yet, folks, this is one you want to turn to in the current issue. I know there's a lot of other competing material in there for your attention, but this is a one heck of a story, and um, it's one of uh, interest, I think, in terms of the idea of what you do when you're shot down, and uh, it's kind of a case study of that, and it's also a very inspiring story on its own merits. So. Um, Ed, thank you for sharing this with us and our readers. Uh, it's a, it was definitely um, something that was worth um, being dusted off the shelf and remind people that this occurred. Um, weirdly enough, just 60 years ago, this very wow. spring and summer. Mm -hmm. um, how does that happen? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm well, sure we'll have you back on here again soon, Ed, because I'm looking forward to having you in the magazine again. Uh, it's <laughs> always right. good talking with you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to appear in front of your audience and speak about it's a good news story here. 
It not is. a lot of good news stories came out of Vietnam, but this is certainly <laughs> one. Indeed so. But, you know, I'm really impressed with his dedication to naval service. I mean, having suffered through captivity and mistreatment and all that, shoot down and all that, but he goes on to really be make a contribution to the U.S. Navy in our history. Serves until the 1980s. It's, yeah, it's, that, yeah. too, is remarkable and admirable, indeed. Right. Well, thanks again, Ed, and we look forward to seeing you here next time. I guess that's it for us today, folks. And um, until next time, I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Look forward to talking to you again very soon. Take care.